Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to a midweek uh, edition of the Scientific Governance and Risk Meeting. My name is Richard Brown. It's April 21st. We're going to talk about um, uh, some, some weighty themes today, uh, particularly as they relate to the state of the PEG. Um, the PEG has been uh, off by a couple percent uh, ever since um, the apocalypse happened, and we're here to uh, do a little bit of a level set, establish some context and figure out what next steps might look like. Um, I'm not going to dig into too many of the details. I'm not good at numbers. I'm mostly just good at people. So I'll hand off the, the, uh, the actual analytics to the people that get paid to do that stuff. Um, I want to uh, do some brief folding because I know how much everybody looks forward to this at the opening of these calls. So I'm going to set some context, uh, throw some questions out there and have hopefully have these things um, percolate in the back of people's minds as we discuss how did Adam mix stuff and skip in? Who's ran? Like, sorry, so you just letting everybody uh, in? No, I, I know who Adam, I know Adam is. Some guy said he was in him. I'm pretty, I know who it is. Is that literally his last name? I don't know. No, of course that. not. It's like... <laughs> All right, uh, sorry for the brief detour. So here we go, uh, some philosophy. Uh, we have uh, an open governance system. There's uh, long debates and debates that will not end anytime soon about the utility of uh, human governance uh, versus algorithmic governance as uh, the engineers in the world endlessly march to have us all replaced by Python scripts. And in, in the meantime, we're not there yet. Uh, people need to uh, be able to review and uh, consider exogenous circumstances and make decisions uh, that the machines cannot make for us. And we might be in a position to uh, begin to uh, think about that right now. And part of that, uh, or, or the impetus for this discussion is directly related to a post in the forums uh, called The State of the Peg uh, by Parafly Capital. Um, and they brought some concerns to the ecosystem. This is a fantastically healthy development in my books, regardless of whatever the context or the content of the post was, we've seen um, direct uh, interaction with some of our largest holders uh, in a very visible way for the first time. And I, I'm looking forward to having this happen more and more often as uh, uh, the large maker holders begin to um, directly manage their positions in our ecosystem, which, for many reasons, which we will not get into in this call, um, is a good thing because of how wonderfully aligned incentives happen to be in the, the way that the protocol is designed. So uh, we are here to discuss the state of the peg. Um, there's a, a series of arguments and um, uh, thoughts and suggestions in uh, the post from Parify. Um, Actually, I, before we can take a little fork in the road here, is someone from Parify on the call? Um, I can either very briefly review the forum post that was made. Yeah, you, you have us on the call. You have the Parify team on the call. Great. What uh, Does one of you want to, uh, maybe in a couple minute or two, give us a review of what the forum post was all about to set some context for the rest of the team? Sorry to put you on the spot like that. If not, I can I can just do it. It's not a big deal. This is Ben. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, I'll, I'll I'll keep it really brief. Um, you know, I, I I think that you know what the the impetus behind the post was you know simply that um, we're in somewhat of an unprecedented situation on Maker in that all of the obvious levers from a monetary policy perspective have, have been pulled, but DAI kind of still remains significantly off the peg. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, in talking to different DeFi teams, building applications in the space, we've, you know, heard increasing frustration with the lack of liquidity and the volatility of DAI in, you know, over the past month, kind of compelling people to look at other stable coins as a primitive and you know, that, that's, that was kind of concerning for us on its face because, you know, we care, you know, deeply about the success of, of MakerDAO. And I think at the core of that is ensuring that DAI is both stable and liquid. Um, and so, you know, as we think, 
into the future about what other levers could be pulled, we wanted to reach out to the community and, and suggest some options. Um, you know, certainly, like, I think one of the things that, you know, the maker community has done an excellent job of is, you know, being very thoughtful, kind of, and methodical about how governance works. And, you know, certainly, like, the, the MIP uh, process is, um, you know, very thoughtful and commendable. Our concern was kind of that action needed to be taken more decisively and swiftly rather than waiting kind of the four to eight weeks that it might take to add new collateral types or take take action. Um, and so we, you know, we suggested kind of several potential remedies um, to, to restore the peg and to add liquidity. Um, we, um, you know, don't really have any particular bias towards any one of the options. I mean, certainly we think some are better than others or more feasible than others. You know, we think frankly that like we, what we do feel conviction behind is that action does need to be taken and it should be taken swiftly and it, it you know, and, and, and it, it shouldn't be dragged out. So maybe I'll pause there. That's, that's kind of, if anyone else on the Parify team has anything to add to what I said, you know, please, please feel free to, to jump in. Hey everyone, this is, this is Anjan with uh, Parify. I guess just, just a quick note on that. Um, I think there's, I guess, two buckets. There's kind of these more drastic collateral, you know, onboarding challenges and, and process that we're kind of monitoring. There's kind of these more existing monetary policy changes. And we think we can kind of take this multifaceted approach towards adjusting the peg. It doesn't necessarily just have to be onboarding new collateral or adjusting new levers. We think we can, you know, adjust a few of the levers that we still have in mind, whether that is the USD, USDC stability fee. Uh, for example. So it, it'd just be really great to kind of continue the conversation here and just get feedback and ultimately take a multifaceted approach. Okay, thanks for the uh, thanks for the recap. I've posted the link to the forum in the sidebar. There's a lot of thread to read, so I'm not sure if people are going to get caught up in the next couple of minutes, but it's there for reference. And I think that um, the swift action is the theme that we need to uh, latch on to here. Um, what is the nature of switch swift action? Um, is swift action needed? What are the options available to us? Uh, and this loops back to um, a theme that I've been, or a beat that I've been hitting uh, in a number of calls recently. And I'm going to continue to do that, I think, because um, for whatever reason, exogenous circumstances, um, just general roadmap type stuff, we are reaching sort of a tipping point in the ecosystem or in our protocol. I keep on saying ecosystem as if the protocol is the ecosystem. It's not a good look. So inside of our protocol, we're reaching this tip, tipping point where the amount of things that are on the go, the things that need to happen, uh, potentially are exceeding our capacity to execute them the way that we'd uh, planned originally when we started talking about these things. And so this, I've been sort of framing this as intention versus feasibility. Um, uh, dark fixes, GSMs, uh, collateral compensation, SCD shutdown, um, and rapid response to peg deviation are all uh, a series of um, uh, initiatives that are largely driven external, external to the organization. And that is a good thing because that's the whole point of what we're up to right now is that, uh, we're not right now, since the very beginning, is that um, the the protocol is governed from without. That's the whole intention and that has to happen for us to uh, effectively decentralize. Um, there is a disconnect though that's appearing more and more often that we need to address and that disconnect is intention versus feasibility or intention. What, how do we get from intention to implementation? So we can have a signal externally that X needs to happen on Y date. Um, that doesn't mean that that's going to happen. Uh, here's why, uh, because external intention requires uh, internal or engaged stakeholders to actually do the work uh, and work takes time. Um, so that's one of the things that I wanna throw out there to subconsciously percolate throughout the course of this call because there's a call to action. Um, let's fix the peg as initiated by Parify Capital. We're here to talk about how that will work. Let's keep in the back of our minds um, what we want versus uh, what a uh, rational implementation plan might look like. Um, so here is the end of me throwing out weighty questions. I'm going to hand it over to Cyrus to give us clear and actionable answers to all of his questions. 
sorry, sorry, I, I couldn't resist. So uh, I'm going to hand it off to you, and maybe we can talk about where the thread landed and some of the decisions that uh, the risk team has on its plate these days. Sure. Hey, guys. Um, so just a quick recap of what happened in the governance community over the weekend, past couple of days. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, Parify Capital put out a thread on Saturday, and at the end of it, there was a uh, there was a forum poll asking if whether the current situation constituted some sort of emergency or not. Um, and the reason this is being impo is important is because if it is deemed an emergency, and and it was voted yes uh, by about I think seventy by about two thirds, one third. Um, it implies that we have to, it implies that we're willing to take actions that would uh, almost necessarily increase risk to the protocol. Um, otherwise, if it, if it wasn't going to increase our risk, then we would have pulled these levers a long time ago. Um, so, so the few different solution, the few different ideas that were proposed, um, I just want to make sure that we set the context very clearly from the outset is that Pretty much all of the all of the proposals they increase risk to the protocol in some fashion or another. Um, I think the job of governance today and over the next few days in the forums is to kind of evaluate these trade offs as best as possible and um, just maximize that that risk reward ratio. Um, so after a very uh, lively discussion. Um, it appeared that the, the discussion started to center around uh, three or four different proposals. Um, and as a result, we held individual forum polls for each of these four proposals. Uh, they were, uh, the first one was, should we add link as a collateral type to the system? And I'll get into the, or we can get into the pros and cons of all these afterwards. But first one was, should we add link as a collateral type to the protocol? Um, this vote was about two thirds in favor, one third against. Uh, another, another proposal that was batted around was adding a new instance of ETH as a collateral type, but with a lower liquidation ratio. Uh, so basically a higher leverage ETH. Um, this one was the only poll that was actually voted against, uh, although it was certainly a close vote. The third one was the idea of adding additional fiat backed stable coins, such as uh, PAX USD or TUSD or any other stable coin, potentially even Tether for what it's worth. Um, and then lastly uh, was a proposal to change the risk parameters of the current USDC implementation. So something along the lines of um, uh, lowering the stability fee severely, um, basically to near zero, and also potentially lowering the, the liquidation ratio to make it more capital efficient. Um, so these are so these were the four ideas. Uh, the three that were seemed to garner support was again link, additional stable coins, and optimizing the USDC parameters. Um, given kind of the very short term nature of this cycle, um, so presumably governance may be interested in adding, uh, implementing some of these, these solutions potentially as early as this week, if not next week. Um, it means we're going to have to kind of rush through the whole process. Uh, unfortunately, there there will not be time to kind of do a deep dive analysis into Link, for example, and evaluate all of the the nuances. Um, there won't be sufficient time to you know, do a super deep dive into TUSD, for example, and, and try to have a, a long, fruitful discussion on its counterparty risk. Um, we got we got to go with governance heuristics and logic, and then try to uh, iterate as quickly as we can over time, so that we end up in a state that we're happy to be in uh, as a community. Um, so yeah, so I mean, there's there's a bunch of 
items to discuss on the agenda in addition to just trying to hash out the risk parameters for these collateral types. But other things I'm interested in hearing from today are um, some sort of proposed timeline for implementation. Uh, so some of these can fairly trivially be implemented this week. So for example, changing the USDC parameters should be really no more than, a, than an executive vote. Um, whereas at the other spectrum, adding a completely new collateral type such as link requires a, uh, an end-to-end -end process that involves a whole bunch of engineering efforts and integrations efforts and um, just a, a lot of things on that pipeline. So I'm hoping to hear from some of the teams that are involved with collateral onboarding today as well on this call. Um, all that being said, just to wrap this up, I want to try to keep this a free form discussion. I'd like to see as much participation as possible. Um, as I said, there isn't any sort of like very specific presentation or from, from the risk team or anything like this. Um, it's kind of been more ad hoc in nature. And there was just a really, really amazing discussion the last few days in the forums. And I just kind of would like to see this be somewhat of an extension of that. I'm gonna pause there for comments for anybody to kick this off. Well, if nobody volunteers, I'll, I'll just say that anything that relates to adding new collateral, of course, means, um, you know, adapters and uh, more smart contracts work. So we do have to take that into consideration if, uh, you know, the community votes yes on either of these things. And uh, I'm not even talking about, you know, the risk parameters. I'm just talking about the, um, the due diligence uh, that needs to happen when onboarding new collateral at the technical level. Hey, this is uh, Ben from Parify again. Um, I mean, I think if you kind of look at the four options that were proposed as potential um, remedies or partial remedies, and we were to kind of stack rank them from, you know, uh, easiest to implement to most difficult to implement, as well as from, you know, call, call it most consensus to least consensus, I think kind of the easiest to implement and, and the, the one that has kind of the most community support, at least based on the polling results, seems to be um, the USDC stability fee and liquidation ratio. Um, so, I mean, maybe, you know, uh, as a group, we can kind of start by discussing that and seeing kind of where people would be comfortable moving those, those parameters to um, as a start. Yeah, so I've heard a lot of um, feedback from the community regarding USDC um, on basic on the stability fee, how it basically started super high at 20%, and then it's just kind of very slowly been coming down and potentially at, at too slow a pace. Uh, I won't rehash, I won't get into the, the reasoning behind why it started so high again. Uh, we've talked that to death on this call. but. Um, yeah, at, at, at this point, it feels like the community is definitely leaning towards USDC being more for die peg management. Um, and that would certainly warrant lower, significantly lower stability fees. Um, just looking at other kind of other protocols and other comparables, I mean, I think the USDC stability fee can just go um well i'd like to hear some other thoughts but i mean there's it could really go as low as the community wants it to go um so i think maybe some sort of informal poll for that might be useful but i i wouldn't say that there's really much in the form of um so okay so here are the risk considerations with with the stability fee one is obviously the counterparty risk which um for better or worse, we more or less 
we, we haven't really discussed too in depth until now. And then additionally, as a reminder, the liquidations for USDC are currently disabled. Um, and so the community is internalized with what that means for USDC and potentially other stable coins that may be added in similar fashion. Another data point is um, as recently as just sometime in the last week or two, uh, you could have borrowed DAI against USDC on compound for 0.5% for a 0.5% stability fee. Um, and as I understand it, it wasn't really heavily utilized. So this may potentially dull the any intended effects that we're hoping to see out of this. Um, it's hard to say how much die generation would be created from making the USDC parameters less conservative, but it's certainly an effective, it's potentially an effective option. Yeah. Uh, hey, Cyrus, it's Tom from, from Dragonfly. Um, I, I'm a bit uh, skeptical that the like stable coin route is going to generate meaningful die generation. I think partially for the reasons that that you mentioned, which is just like, um, I, I don't know if, if stability fees are really uh, the thing that's driving um, die generation, given that there's already competitive lending protocols out there that are already offering great rates. Um, I think the problem is just like, um, as you mentioned, there's sort of a, uh, there's, there's sort of a cap to uh, you know, the usage of these things, right? They're used for, for, for uh, peg, peg maintenance. And so you can imagine in a world where you know, we lower the USDC uh, stability fee. Um, really, this is a useful tool for people going long on the, on the particular pair, which would be DAI USDC. Um, so if people see DAIs above the peg, they want to short it, they generate DAI, sell it for USDC. And, and so we sort of reduce, um, <clears throat> we, we generate DAI supply and, and sell it to drop the price of DAI. The problem is like, there's a fundamental ceiling, right? There's not going to be long-term sustained open interest um, in doing this trade, um, because as soon as DAI starts to drop, you know, that below a dollar, people want to close out. And so, you know, as quickly as that DAI was, was, was minted, um, it will be, you know, bought back up and, and, and closed out. So like, you know, it, it's like, if we all wanted to go, you know, drop the price of DAI today, after this call, we could go on, you know, put a few million dollars into DYDX and just short the shit out of DAI, but it's not going to generate any new DAI. And so it's like a, it's like a superficial price win. Um, really what you need is you need more DAI um, being sold on the books. And for that, you need sustained open interest um, in doing this sort of like um, margin trade with whatever the particular collateral is. So I think that the stable coin route is like, it's a great utility, but I don't see this being a way to, you know, really long-term open up, open up the DAI supply, which seems to be what we need to do right now. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, is there a distinction in your mind though between it, I mean, it may not fix the peg because as you said, people will cover right when it gets close, but does it not improve liquidity in the short run and at least improve conditions such that yeah. it's probably worth it? In the short run, but you know, it's a very short period of time. I don't know why anyone would, you know, pay money um, or the very least you know, had the opportunity cost of having their USDC sitting in maker um, just to make uh, die. Like I, it's it's really only useful for this for this trade. Um, otherwise, it's it's just a, sort of a strictly losing value proposition, especially given, considering that they would be getting paid to you know, deposit that USDC somewhere else. And if a lot of people try to make that trade and then the die peg doesn't correct, you run the possibility of a short squeeze that makes the peg deviation even worse as fees build up. So anyway, that's all to say, I think we need to really be focused on figuring out some way to, you know, not, I don't wanna say permanently, but um, on a very long time horizon, um, encourage people to generate DAI, um, which generally means, you know, creating some sort of um, long-term interest in, in levering up on, on the underlying. Um, so Ether um, has, has been, you know, pretty productive for this, but I think that needs to be sort of the, 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 the focus of, of this discussion.
Um, yep. This is this is Charlie from Paradigm. Um, Tom, I'm not sure that I entirely agree with the point that like long term generation from DAI or, or demand for leverage on the underlying collateral um, as equivalent is like really the issue here. Um, there's liquidity and then there's simply like the market price of DAI. Um, and I think that the, the absolute supply relative to is like uh, in a long run, generally in markets um, for an asset like this or a swap like this correlated with, um, you know, the sort of like available liquidity will work at a greater size. So I agree on that point, but to like the actual market price of DAI, like irrespective of a liquidity concern, which I think would be fairly said is greater than a dollar today, not greater than a dollar at some um, marginal size, like isn't really, that's kind of a distinct issue from the absolute amount of DAI in existence. Um, so I'm not sure that I agree that like strictly trying to increase the supply here is, um, as the goal, it like is an appropriate goal because there's no real reason to believe that like marginal demand for dollars or marginal demand for dollars that can be lent out on compound at like 4.6% or whatever um, will actually decrease with a greater absolute number of die in a vacuum. Like, in fact, you'd expect that not to be true, really, unless there was some like magic constant hiding here um, that we're unaware of. No, I, I think that that's a very fair point. Um, I, I think my point is is more broadly just focusing on trying to correct the, the price by um, using this USDC pair um, is is uh, going to be sort of a superficial victory. Um, so I, I I agree, uh, but it's like this specific problem I think is or this specific solution I don't think is like going to be the most uh, effective way to do this. Yeah, um, I agree with that. And I also agree that in the short term, um, decreasing the USDC stability fee is likely to um, fix the problem. But to a couple of comments on um, how we view the addition of collateral or like sort of the broader um, discussion, um, I think Cyrus is correct in that um, USDC as like a peg management tool, um, I think probably uh, is not going to be viable in the medium to long term, like given the attached counterparty risk, um, or really that um, like as a simple thought experiment, there's some region of, you know, the percentage of DAI collateralized by USC as a non-bearer asset able to be um, called at any time by the issuer versus ETH, at which we would say DAI itself is no longer a bearer asset or not decentralized. So like put very simply, um, when 99% of all DAI is composed of underlying ETH collateral, it doesn't really matter what happens to USDC, all of it could get called by the issuer and whatever, the system probably continues and like DAI as a whole or DAI shelling point isn't really affected. On the flip side, if 99% of all DAI is underlied by USDC, um, or even I would argue a constellation of assets with similar counterparty risks attached to them, i.e. that aren't truly bearer assets, um, then DAI itself is no longer a bearer or decentralized asset. Um, and so I think on that side of the collateral, we're kind of hesitant to treat it as like a viable lever to lean on anytime there's an issue with the peg, um, especially longer than in the short term. Um, then to the other points on, on additional collateral types, um, I think that it, there's a lot of moral hazard posed by approaching um, an issue, like a monetary policy issue with um, 
like letting that sort of impact how we view collateral risk discussions. USDC, I think, could be fairly argued on Black Thursday as a true one-off or um, sort of like um, exogenous event. But to do that going forward, um, it seems like kind of an unreasonable uh, position to say that um, you know collateral risk governance is actually a fair process if um, like the primary impetus for most of, uh, in, in hindsight, at this point, it would be most of the most meaningful decisions we make as a group being monetary policy related. Um, so like, that's kind of just a general um, concern about the moral hazard posed. Um, I think that in summary, um, we're more excited about um, continuing to try uh, the monetary policy levers, then letting this bleed over into um, collateral parameters or would be in a vacuum. But if we were to do that in the short term um, as potentially the easiest fix, think that it should be um, done intentionally with the view uh, or the understanding that it's quite likely that we won't be able to access these same levers uh, like in similar future situations. I'm yeah, going to it, take an opportunity to ask a potentially stupid question um, because I've had enough caveats that I don't understand how money works. So hopefully people will forgive me. So uh, maybe somebody from the risk team can uh, speak to this question about whether w w do we just simply exist in a risk off environment? Do we know that people are still seeking leverage? Do we know that there's an appetite for the product that we have? Uh, are people going elsewhere? or is this systemic, um, this lack of liquidity issue? Can, does yeah. maybe Primo so, or somebody? Yeah, let me I touch on that. Um, so briefly, the, the point was asked a couple of weeks ago, actually, if this was sort of a momentary pause in activity on Maker, or if this was like some sort of, you know, exodus of demand to other platforms. Um, I think the first point to mention is this is like a market condition event going on right now. Um, so to some extent, there is a decreased global demand for leverage on ETH because a lot of people are potentially uncomfortable with what's going on with ETH price right now and not quite ready to lever up, which just kind of exacerbates what's going on with DAI. Um, it's not so much like this is a purely maker specific issue. Um, that being said, obviously, when DAI is consistently trading above a dollar, that creates a bit more additional uncertainty of a type that the system has not really had to deal with yet, where people are a little bit uncertain of the timing of DAI returning back to PEG. And so they're um, also more hesitant to do things like market making or to, you know, take out debt. Um, because they're unsure of at what price they'd be able to close out those positions that they're effectively opening up. Um, so that's kind of the obvious problem that I think brought a lot of people to this conversation. Um, in terms of segmenting out USDC versus other collateral assets versus price impact versus you know, liquidity, um, the, the main thing I think that's important to make clear that is separate is on the one hand, you have the dive peg um, and the fact that it's trading above and the general uncertainty associated with that. On the other hand, you have the idea that there's demand um, being at sort of a, a low or globally depressed level. Um, and if demand for leverage is just generally lower, it, it actually kind of potentially overrides what's going on with, with the dive peg in terms of um, preventing you know people from taking out new debt positions so there's a separate problem which is the market making and the availability of things like usdc versus the actual demand and desire for leverage so you could increase the die supply but if you're not also increasing the demand for leverage there you're potentially not solving the problem um, that's so, where i wanted to sort of narrow the conversation to, to 
to examine whether the solutions that are being presented in the state of the peg thread are specific are, are targeting a micro problem within the protocol or whether they're targeting a macro program pro problem with the, the market itself. So is the addition of new collateral types going to solve the fact that uh, everything is burning all around us or is this a long-term fix or a short-term fix? Yeah, well, actually I want to jump in on yeah. that one because I, I wanted to respond to Charlie's comment earlier on moral hazard as well. And just to be clear, yeah, like I think this does, I think adding collateral will fix the solution, but we'll fix the problem, but these are very short-term solutions. Um, and if we keep finding ourselves in this hole over and over again, uh, we, will, we will have to take on increasingly more risk every subsequent time this happens. Um, and so if, if we don't also start working on long-term solutions, we're gonna be in a bit of a pickle down the line. Hey guys, this yes. is uh, uh, Kevin from Parify. I just wanted to, to provide kind of my, my view on, on everything that's happening here, um, not just from a micro specific uh, sort of you know, maker specific issue, but really uh, as a global sort of issue that we're seeing in the market. So kind of if you backtrack to what happened uh, over the past couple of months in financial markets and global economies, uh, you saw this big, you know, risk off you know, a sentiment where people sold off risk on assets and moved into potentially cash. Uh, what, what cash is that? That's usually mostly US dollars because people kind of trust that currency above uh, other other currencies. So uh, DAI is really a proxy of, of, a, of, of a dollar really uh, just in, you know, in, in crypto dollars, if you, if you want to say it that way. And um, if, you, if you look at, you know, the strength of the dollar over, over other uh, emerging uh, uh, currents, emerging market currencies, uh, it's been significantly higher. I mean, the dollar rally like 4%, 5% uh, in March and so on is, is since normalized. But it's normalized because, uh, you know, central banks have had this mentality of do whatever it takes. That's literally a quote from the European Central Bank that is like, we'll do whatever it, it takes to maintain the economy, to inject liquidity, uh, you know, uh, monetary uh, money supply M2 has increased by 11% from an all-time high before uh, the events kind of unfolded over the past couple of months from like 15 to trillion to 17 trillion. Uh, so there's been just this massive uh, uh, injection of liquidity by central banks to try to keep the dollar stable. Um, and that's, that's adding liquidity. Banks need that liquidity. Uh, people need that liquidity to make sure that the system continues to to function so that you know credit swap lines don't break and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, the Fed funds rate is already at 65 bips. And so I don't think that really the, the fact that we're talking about monetary levers of uh, USDC bringing it down you know, to, to zero is really what's gonna make uh, uh, dr drive any sort of structural change uh, around the die peg. Really what's happening is that because of this, part, partly because there is this a flight to safety and uh, some people are using DAI as a proxy to a dollar potentially because they cannot actually buy dollars. Um, for example, if you look at the, there was a website shared by one of the members from the maker team um, that shows how DAI in, Argent, in, in Argentine pesos is trading around 10% above, uh, above, you know, above spot really uh, offshore markets because people have this strong bid for DAI. Um, so there's certainly this really relentless bid for DAI and that is not being uh, matched equally by a offer to sell DAI. And that's partly because, you know, we're in somewhat of a risk off, uh, 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 you know, cycle. So the only way I see uh, uh, DAI coming into circulation is by adding new collateral types, by, by expanding the, the money supply uh, that DAI can, uh, you know, so that DAI can flow back into the system and somewhat maintain a structural equilibrium versus really just approaching it from a, a uh, you know, just like a quick lever, let's see if die reverts by printing eight, eight, eight million dollars. So, you know, like in, if, 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 if the Maker Foundation had the, uh, I mean, not, not that it doesn't have the authority, but if it, if, if this was the, the, you know, its sole role, it should be buying, you know, ETH itself and minting die to maintain the stability of, of the peg, right? Just like a normal central bank would kind of go by, increase the balance sheet and, and kind of print money for lack of a better word. Uh, I think that, if that's not a feasible way of doing it, I certainly think that the uh, additional collateral 
uh, options are, are the way to go to, to bring a long-term stability to the peg uh, and not look in, not, not focus on some of the, uh, the, the small monetary level levers that are left uh, to pull because I don't think that's really what's going to fix uh, what's happening to the die peg given, given the macroeconomic and both the, the sort of structural issues that uh, the maker system is currently experiencing. I'm not sure that I follow that logic in that the monetary levers, quote unquote, is probably a, a misnomer. Um, and apologies if that like raised some hackles that it wasn't intended to, but I'm, I think that exactly your point around the demand for dollars is um, kind of at odds with the idea that the addition of uh, new collateral or the expansion of the collateral base inherently changes the equilibrium um, price of DAI. Like, I, I, I don't really think that's true. To the extent that it's the case that uh, Maker, to your point, not a central bank, but the underwriter of a bunch of credit swap lines doesn't have the ability to prevent the neutral interest rate on those swaps from breaching zero, i.e. the point at which the strength of the dollar means that rather than being uh, paid to take out, or rather than paying to take out leverage against it, you, you actually have to uh, pay to offer exposure, uh, or sorry, pay for exposure $2. Um, that argument would lend itself to the idea that the, uh, the interest rate on DAI uh, or the stability fee should in fact be negative or given that mechanically that's not possible, the target rate should be lowered below one. Um, basically, that I think that argument that if this really is an issue about the strength of the dollar relative uh, to all other assets broadly means its neutral interest rate, DAI's neutral interest rate is less than zero, then long-term that is the only option. And the expansion of the collateral base won't fundamentally change um, that equation. So the solution potentially here is that uh, an increase in liquidity by onboarding collateral uh, increases that buffer or sort of the capacity for homeostasis in the system while negative rates get hashed out in the future. Is that the, is that the plan? Yeah, the broader one being that negative rates, like it, it's a misnomer to call it it's a misnomer to call these levers in my mind like monetary policy levers again. And also it's not really an interest rate in the same way that a central bank would think of one just to like make it explicit, right? Like the foundation, we collectively as a community don't have the benefit of underwriting an arbitrary amount of liquidity risk uh, or even take a step further solvency risk um, as Kevin made the point, the Fed is willing to and other central banks have the ability to um, in terms of, of their own currencies. So it's like, if we were to reframe the question as, you know, DAI is ultimately um, a dollar swap fixed for floating, fixed for floating dollar swap on uh, the collateral base underwritten by us as MKR holders as like a decentralized clearinghouse. There's no reason that that, that interest rate, whatever you want to call it, swap rate uh, can't be negative at all oil and gold flip frequently. Emerging market currencies and other commodities uh, like frequently flip. Um, there's no zero bound here. Like this, we're not a, number one, we're not a central bank, but two, it's not even like number one, we, sorry. We can have that discussion about like, if we wanted to frame maker as a central bank and like whether or not it could breach zero in that case, but it's kind of a moot conversation because we're not. And so the, it's kind of, in our view, it's, it's, it would be unfortunate to treat that as, um, to treat the target rate as like 
having constraints on it that in fact don't exist and, and perhaps are, are the only way to actually bring this peg back to one if, if that is the goal here. Hey, hey Charlie, on, on that note, how, how are you thinking about the precedent um, that kind of comes into effect if you do adjust the target rate and does it kind of ever revert back or does it remain floating in, in, your, in your opinion? Um, I think that this is probably uh, a longer discussion that would require like more context to be set beforehand to have um, to have a meaningful one around it. But I I think that the original vision for the target rate feedback mechanism, um, without getting into the specifics of or like uh, of that proposal or the mechanics, is like one way to think about it. Um, I think that the if if we abstract the target rate out as a way of getting to a negative stability fee, given that we can't literally implement mechanically a negative stability fee, it becomes much easier to think about. Uh, then the answer to your question, Anjan, is, is clearly yes, which is uh, if at some point, you know, the neutral swap rate becomes uh, positive again first die would return to one dollar as the target rate and then the stability fee would become positive um it's like mechanically unfortunate that we can't actually implement it that way but conceptually it's essentially the same I guess, you know, practically speaking, uh, like negative stability fees and adjusting the target rate are not really things we can do in a, in a short period of time to address this. If, if I understand correctly from the, the foundation team and, and uh, you know, in, in kind of how long it would take to implement these things, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's, uh, it's particularly feasible in addressing kind of like more of like the near term, uh, the, the, the near term price. I, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone on the call. I, I, I feel like, look, I, I hear kind of some of the points around adjusting the USDC parameters and maybe they won't be effective, but I think it's hard to argue it's not positive sum in that, you know, it may not fully solve the problem, but it will help it incrementally. So it's not like, I don't view it as a panacea in adjusting the die peg back to, back to one, um, but will it help on the margin? I think it's hard to argue that it wouldn't, like if you lower rates from eight to close to zero. And I also think you can do it in a way that, you know, mitigates risk to the system. If we're thinking, you know, as we kind of underwrite USDC risk, if we leave the debt ceiling as is, but just lower the interest rate, you know, we're still we're still effectively kind of taking the binary, you know, binary uh, bearer risk on USDC, regardless of of, of what the stability fee is. Um, like, I, I guess in my mind, like the core product of Maker is die being stable and die being liquid, and so the core product is isn't working right now, um, and so really like fixing it, you know, with more urgency, I, I think is important. Um, the other thing that like, I think bears mentioning is just the cost of capital um, on MakerDAO right now is, is more than 0%. So like if you're opening up a CDP, posting ETH borrowing DAI, even though stability fee is 0%, the implied cost of capital is, is just much, much higher than that given you know, you're paying exchange fees when you sell and when you buy, and you're also incurring slippage when you sell and when you buy, plus you're taking kind of die volatility risk. Um, and so kind of you boil those all together and depending on the duration of, of the loan, you know, your implied cost of capital could be, you know, you know, it, you know in the mid teens. Um, so if you can fix the liquidity, you can fix the cost of capital. But I, I, I do think that 
really like the two very much go go hand in hand. Um, and so I, I guess, you know, to summarize, like my, my view is, I mean, I, I just think very practically, like some, you know, action needs to be taken sooner and it needs to be kind of the most pragmatic, uh, simplest actions. And even though, even though some of the things that have been proposed in the forums may not in and of themselves fully solve the problem, I think collectively they'll all chip away at the problem and put us on the right path. And in the interim, we can continue to brainstorm other longer term solutions like the ones that Charlie's mentioning. But I think in the very near term, we just need to kind of focus on what we can actually do to, to help um, kind of alleviate this, the, the, the lack of liquidity. I might take this opportunity. We're at uh, five minutes against the top of the hour to circle us back to um, part of my prescient theme of intention versus feasibility. Um, uh, Cyrus, maybe can can you speak a bit to what uh, the polls stated in the forum post, um, sort of what the implications of those might be, um, and then possibly talk to feasibility because um, there's signaling has happened in that forum post. People. Presumably, uh, it's not simply right. just presumably the people have spoken uh, to a certain extent. And so uh, those, there's stakeholders involved in this process though. And this is the caution that I have is that uh, we should do something that's great. It's gonna take 50 or a hundred people to do that thing. So let's think about what this actually means. So right, so, I mean, the next step would be an on-chain governance poll. Um, and it would be great if the governance poll for that um, could contain the proposed risk parameters for whatever collateral type wants to be added. And then additionally, um, have to work with the governance crew, you and Long for Wisdom and others, and how to structure the polls. Or if we're gonna have uh, one, one governance poll that holds all the collateral types are just individual one by one. Um, and then, yeah, I think today and tomorrow we should we need to get some form threads going to start hammering out risk parameters as well. Um, I was hoping we could do it on this call, but I, I think that's becoming a little bit less less likely at this stage. Um, yeah, in terms of- Let's clarify what the target is though. So the idea is, okay, we had the discussion uh, over the weekend with the forum thread. We have a call today to discuss some meta issues and see if anything surfaces. Um, and then we move into threads, uh, bro broken down threads per collateral type, as I suggest. And then those have to get translated to the, the actual governance mechanism. So um, for timing, the, the hope is that we do that tomorrow or the next day, or do we go straight to an executive with these things? Yeah, no, there should be a governance poll, correct? Okay. Um, and is the intention then that after the executive vote happens, what's the delay between uh, intention and implementation there? So uh, executive vote happens on Friday. Do we expect, or does the community expect, is it feasible to have these collateral types just show up uh, in, uh, on the internet? Or, or is there gonna be a delay? And this is, this is maybe where some of the additional stakeholders can contribute some input because um, it's uh, easier said than done. So uh, integrations, uh, business developments, smart contracts, developers, risk, uh, community governance, content, blog posts, writers, the entire org needs to sort of mobilize. And that's just inter inside the org. Uh, that doesn't take into account external parties. Uh, oracles, I forgot oracles as well. So is does anybody want to speak to the feasibility? Does anybody uh, have any blockers that they want to talk about? People that are actually expected to do the work here. And, and one last point, um, there's just to reiterate that there's a distinction between the different solutions, right? So some of them are super easy to implement, such as changing USDC risk parameters, but then adding new collateral types, either new stable coins or Link, for example, uh, would require significant engineering work. So I'd really like to hear from some of the devs on the call. 
Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to the the adapters, but on the Oracle side of things, um, I mean, I've seen the names of, of different stuff thrown around, and, and the only one I've seen that's kind of problematic is uh, is Pax Gold, um, because uh, it's uh, only really listed on Kraken, um, and so there's really not uh, a multitude of price sources that we can really sample, um, and so if you just if you just use Kraken, right, then you're ultimately given, giving Kraken this centralized kind of hook into the system to kind of uh, enact change, right, just by modulating what, what their API returns. Um, so that's kind of an issue that, that needs to be addressed, whereas everything else is, is a lot more straightforward. Um, Nick, can so. we use the, just the gold price for that? Because it's the same as USDC, where it's a centralized uh, custodian. Yeah. I I uh, I don't know if I would feel comfortable with that, but I guess that's for that's for governance to decide. I would definitely I would definitely uh, advocate in favor of using the gold price for for any basically bare assets. Is refer to the underlying. Oh, so sorry for any um custodial uh, IOU assets. Refer to the to the underlying rather than to the very you know poor liquidity that it might have wherever it is that you're looking for the tokenized version. Okay. Yeah, that that that's certainly uh, that's certainly something we can we can look at. I just wanted to add that, that Pax Gold, like if, if if anyone hasn't looked into it yet, I recommend to look into it because Pax Gold has very robust um, uh, redeemability, um, uh, kind of you know operationally. I think it's 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 by far superior than any other gold uh, gold token that I've seen. So you, if, you know if you literally have an account with a um, with a with with a with a, with a clearing broker at um, the London uh, gold thing, whatever it's called, you can literally get uh, that gold into your, into your account the same day from, from Pax Gold and, and, and vice versa. I have a worry about um, any, any sort of off-chain custody situation like this though. Um, if for some reason their vaults turn up empty, uh, the price of that token can decline quickly. And um, if we're still, still displaying the, the commodity gold price and the token market doesn't reflect that, that, that can be problematic. It can be problematic, but can it, it can also be um, helpful in certain circumstances as well. So uh, for example, a lot of people have um, questioned whether it's a smart idea to have liquidations disabled for USDC and have the price just set to one. Um, but there's an argument to be made that if something disastrous were to happen and the price were to fall to say 20 cents or 50 cents or just anything, that it might be better to not liquidate those and have maker governance uh, try to resolve that issue out of, out of protocol. It could probably, it could potentially get better value out of that collateral um, through some sort of off-chain system rather than just liquidating it at fire sale prices. Um, so the same might apply for others as well. So if Pax Gold, were to, for whatever reason, drops severely in price, it may be worth it to try to resolve that somehow out of there. Just an idea. It, it's just not, I'm just, my point is it's just not so clear cut. I, I agree with Cyrus. I think kind of the way to summarize this with these uh, with these IOU assets is that you know marking counterparty risk to market is just not a um, is just it has a very poor um, signal to noise ratio. So you just it just doesn't seem to be like a good idea in general to try to manage counterparty risk by um, looking at the market price of something, especially if the um, you know the tokenized version of it is less liquid than the, than the underlying. There's just a much greater chance that you're going to be picking up some kind of noise rather than actually correctly. Um, updating based on the counterparty risk of the of the asset. So that means that you know the way to manage counterparty risk is probably through um, diversification. That is to say, managing the debt ceiling to make sure that you know you've you'd accepted the possibility of um, of, of counterparty risk without um, without risking ruin. Given that it would be um, it would be capped by the by the debt ceiling. The same thing stands for for for, for USDC, Fax Gold, and, and and all the other ones. So it's focus on the on the on, on the on the issuer and. Um, and on the, on the underlying asset, in my opinion, just because these things tend to have, um, you know, uh, secondary markets that are, you know, basically not uh, not liquid enough that you would actually choose to mark counterparty risk to them. I think that's a good point. And we um, just what I was talking about is by definition a black swan event in that collateral type. So 
Um, but maybe I'm being overcautious there. Yeah, to be clear, I'm not saying that we should be less cautious about it. I'm just saying that the approach should be uh, defensive with a debt ceiling rather than trying to basically pick up information in real time from some market price. And then, you know, it, I, I think that that just introduces more risk than it, than it mitigates. Hey, I'm kind of curious, uh, what do people think about WBTC as a collateral type? Because I haven't seen it on anybody's list. I'm completely against that. It's a custodian and centralized by Bitco. It's a good, uh, it's a good token and it's a reputation, uh, a, a good firm, Bitco. But I don't. I think the risk is too high for MakerDAO. Yeah, well, it's not really the risk associated with the, the token itself, or like in some ways, like you know, all wrapped assets kind of deal with this problem of what do you do when it actually mat like when you actually need to mint and redeem a bunch of wrapped BTC. Like when the pressure is on, like you know, Black Thursday or whatever, you know, you could very easily like run into a situation where if that process is not quick enough. Some clever person is going to corner the market and wrap BTC, and you're just gonna, you know, you're gonna get a lot of a, uh, lot of bad, bad results. So like one of the things. Okay, is, isn't, sorry, guys. Isn't isn't the, isn't the thing here about like about debt ceiling again? So like you know, if we're if we're entertaining, obviously we already yeah. have USDC. We're talking about Pax G. Um, <laughs> It does, doesn't the same thing apply to, you know, the WBTC as a custodial asset? Like, obviously, um, I think we'd probably all agree that adding um, uh, WBTC with like a, a huge debt ceiling is, is because it's not the same as it's not the same as as, 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 as ETH, which is a bear is, is a true bear asset. Um, but isn't just a question of debt ceiling. I don't see a convincing argument for why we shouldn't be talking about onboarding WBTC with some debt ceiling. What is what is like when you say like defensive debt ceiling, like what? Like in your mind, like what is that? What does that look uh, like? I, I, that, that's a, that's actually a technical term, but I didn't mean to use I didn't mean to use that. I just meant to say that we should be uh, conservative with the debt ceiling. So oh, for sure, yeah, yeah, for sure. There, there's a mechanism called yeah, defensive sure. debt ceiling, but that's something else. I, I'm just saying, like, what, what you know, why shouldn't we discuss adding uh, assets like WBTC with a, with a conservative debt ceiling? Is there anyone from RAPBTC on the call right now? Because I remember this, like, we had a like the RAPBTC DAO had like a conversation like a few weeks ago about potentially you know getting uh getting involved in like maker governance it'd be nice to get some color from them about how they're thinking about it i mean actually the, the maker foundation is part of the rat btc dow um, oh yeah I think the only person from the foundation who could comment on who knows enough about the involvement of the DAO is Joe, and I don't see him on the call, so I wouldn't expect any commentary there. Um, well, it, it, we don't need to, fo to to linger on WBTC for too long, but I just wanted to add that you know I've spoken to them uh, to the, to Bitgo recently, who is you know the, the the only custodian right now that's 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 participating in that, and they're um, you know they're I think they're very interested in having a discussion with. With the rest of the community, in particular the the maker community, um, about uh, further um, you know about, about starting to decentralize the custodianship of RAP BTC. So the RAP BTC model, if you look at the original white paper, you know actually uh, presupposes that you could have multiple um, multiple custodians, potentially also separate custodians and witnesses. So witnesses being um, you know entities that don't actually custody any assets but act as um, as um, uh, you know essentially vouch for transactions having been finalized on um, on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, this is definitely something that, that could be explored, but obviously is a is a longer is a longer term project. I think just looking at the numbers, um, RAP BTC doesn't have enough doesn't have a high enough debt ceiling to impact the peg. Um, I would imagine that, given the context of all of this, is the somewhat short term nature of this emergency that. We probably wouldn't want to spend time doing additional governance work that doesn't achieve our short-term objective right now. It, it, it just would feel like we're trying to do too much unless somebody strongly feels that it would impact the peg. But just looking, but there's only a, 
7 million of total rack Bitcoin. Um, and that number could, could, could start to go up if you, if you, if you, if you allow, allow this potential in, in Maker, I think. Yeah, I mean, the biggest use case for WPTC is Maker, right? Otherwise, there's really no reason to, to buy Rob BTC. Yeah, so one, one discussion we forgot to talk about at the very beginning was um, how much dye are we even looking to generate to fix our problem? Um, it's not really an easy number to estimate, but I think roughly one to two weeks ago, uh, Primoz did a brief analysis and just purely, purely an estimate. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 10 million die roughly needs to be generated to restore the peg. Um, so if we're looking at solutions that won't in the short term generate more than a couple hundred thousand die at best, I don't know, my personal opinion, just maybe not worth the effort. It's something that could just easily be added as part of a regular governance cycle, you know, when we're past this. I think it depends on if we are having this conversation where we're, we're potentially throwing the kitchen sink of collateral um, at it. And, and you know, if, if, if we're talking about adding link as collateral, then I, you know, I, I don't see why we couldn't talk about adding, uh, adding WBTC as collateral, for example. Well, because link could potentially generate five to 15 million die, right? Depending on the debt ceiling. Um, are, are you just looking at the market cap there, Cyrus? Because I mean, 65% of Link is owned by the devs. There's no reason to believe that uh, it will move to us. And it, even if it does, um, you know, they may just use it as a as a way to kind of ghost liquidate themselves. Well, the, I mean, that's I mean, I would put put it in those terms, but that's the goal, right? We're trying to get people to generate that die, um, and that's that goes back to my original point of like if we want to deal with this, if we want to call this an emergency and deal with it, then we have to take on additional risk, right? And we are looking for short-term solutions that will generate millions of die. Uh, Cyrus, in your pessimism about die generation against WBTC, is that based on current WBTC supply? Uh, it's, it's based on kind of some, some ratios, right? So you can look at, you could look at the total ETH market cap and then just estimate what percentage of that turns into die. And you can do that for, as a, as a, just a rough heuristic for other, right? If, if the die, if die is a hundred million and um, roughly an ETH is a hundred billion, right? Then we're talking about roughly one, one thousandth of the market cap would turn into die. If I'm doing that math right. Um, so something that only has 7 million market cap, it's, unless there, it's just a huge aberration, it's not gonna generate, you're not gonna see half that wrap BTC just hit MakerDAO, in my opinion. Uh, but Cyrus, I think, I think the relevant figure there to compare is, the, is, is, is Bitcoin, not, not WBTC. The, um, uh, you know, I, I very much agree with this point that one of the main, uh, the, the only reason for WBTC to exist is so that people can uh, you know, use it as collateral in, in DeFi and in particular in potentially in Maker. So uh, I would, you know, and Bitcoin's got what, like, well, you know, almost 10 extra market cap of, of Ether. Like I would, I, I very much, I very, you know, very strongly believe that if anyone is going to issue WB, uh, a die against WBTC, they would probably be minting new WBTC um, uh, for it. I, I don't even think it's that relevant how much of it exists now. I mean, obviously we can use that to basically gauge like, you know, how, how effective WBTC, uh, WBTC has been and so on. But, um, I think it's a very it's it's very much a question of creating this market from scratch. Yeah, like I think you could create twenty million um, debt ceiling for WBTC, and that could pretty easily be hit. I mean, WBTC I that. is WBTC is on Compound now, right? Like, so you can use it in some ex like to mint assets against to like uh, borrow assets against. <laughs> I, yep, I think that's you can only too. use it to borrow, but you can't borrow against it. Uh, it's still it's still too. Unless they've changed. Oh, I don't know. You may be right. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Other people. Are yeah, I think it's, it's very sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem, right? We can't know if, right? We can we can clearly see that currently there isn't 
enormous demand for rap Bitcoin and to say that there will be demand for it if it were to get added. Um, I just, I don't see how anyone can definitively say one way or another. Sure. I mean, if it's something governance wants to uh, explore, that's fair too. Yeah. Just, I, it's, per- it's, sorry, it's not the, it's not the ideal candidate because of the low liquidity right now and the centralization, but like, it, it seems like it's already becoming kind of the de facto DeFi Bitcoin solution. Um, now that may change as other solutions come forward, but right now it's like the only option we have. I think IMBTC is also pretty far up there in terms of like uh, market cap though. The, the opt- Just just one quick comment. Um, in terms of, you know, one, one thing is the, the, the supply of the token and, and the growth of the token and such. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, if it's the open, it's essentially the open interest on that underlying asset that it's going to drive the, the liquidity. And I think, you know, aside from Bitcoin having a huge cap, there is also evidence that there is a lot of open interest on Bitcoin leverage, uh, if you look in other markets. So granted, we won't capture all of that, but you know, if that's the fundamental thing that drives liquidity, then, then there's an argument to, that that could grow uh, very significantly in Maker. Yeah, I mean, so just for a second, uh, what we've seen is liquidity is a really important factor. So I think the question to ask with assets like that is in the event that it was used as collateral, you see in these auction mechanics how important it is to have a sense of liquidity for that asset so that it doesn't experience significant slippage mid-auction and basically result in a bunch more losses in the event that it does get liquidated. So question to ask for assets like that, I think, is what liquidity can you reasonably expect now or how much would that grow? Yeah, but I mean, that's a function. Sorry, that's a function of if it's redeemable, right? And there is a creation redemption process for that that works fairly efficiently. I mean, it, it costs money to create and redeem WBTC, but you can trade it on uh, Bitfinex via Diversify, um, and they accept a WBTC as uh, a you know normal BTC, just like Wobi does with their HBTC. Um, I, I think another use case for these, outside of just being able to borrow and lend in. DeFi is uh, on-chain confirmations, being able to move a uh, Bitcoin uh, on Ethereum is much faster than having to wait for uh, block confirms on the BTC blockchain. Uh, I wanted to point out that there's actually some amusing uh, source of data for, 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 for WBTC, which is that um, in, uh, or in particular, in its in its liquidity, when um, the, you know there was this attack uh, on, on BZX, uh, probably it was already a couple months ago now. Um, you know, you had this attacker who ended up with this WBTC position that they needed to liquidate. Um, you know, in which they successfully did over the course of a couple of hours. So if you, if you go back there, you can actually see how this uh, person was you know shopping around. You know, and this person wasn't using any any centralized exchanges, and they were just going around DEXs and basically trying to to, to, to liquidate this WBTC. Um, so this is an interesting kind of. Um, uh, example of a distressed kind of uh, WBTC seller who was basically able to get, you know, in the end, um, you know, a pretty good average price for their for their WBTC that, that they had just uh, stolen. Uh, you know, just by analogy, you know, you know, maker having to liquidate um, WBTC in auctions would also be kind of stressing the same um, the same BTC redemption mechanisms, which you know, evidently uh, work to some extent. But wasn't part of the source of the problem the ability, like the fact that it was a low liquidity asset so that the price was able to be moved on those particular sites um, very quickly? Uh, well, okay, so there were there was two issues. One, well, actually, we don't have to go into that. But basically, yes, there was, you know, if you were just placing market orders on on Kyber or Uniswap or whatever, obviously you were getting a lot of slippage. Um, but, 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 the, but the point is that after the attacker had ended up with all this WBTC, they you know, proceeded to kind of slowly liquidate it out across a variety of different, um, d- different DEXs. Um, that, was over a longer, that was over a longer time scale though. So I, I exactly. guess my point, yes. yeah, during the, during the time frame of auctions is kind of the, the question that I'm talking about. Well, our auctions are six hours now. 
So is six hours enough, I guess? Well, I was suggesting to look at this as as, as an interesting uh, as an interesting data point. Um, in my opinion, you know, they were able to to, to move you know a, quite a large position in you know in kind of an adversarial circumstances, and uh, uh, it's 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 you know it's it's evidence that there's some liquidity there. Yeah, I guess to to my point to the auctions, like you're putting up die to to theoretically win WBTC in an auction, right? So once you win the WBTC, you could pretty quickly turn it into BTC and get rid of it on centralized exchanges, right? So I don't think, at least for an auction point, it's, uh, it's an issue. I do think you do have a good point in terms of uh, pricing, which means, you know, like how, how would the <clears throat> oracles price WBTC? And there, I think, yeah, there are not enough DEXs that trade WBTC in size, so somebody could manipulate that price. But if you used BTC also as a price, then you know, it's it's very hard to like attack it that way, but because I, I do think it has a pretty strong, you know, because there is a creation redemption process, it's tied to PTC fairly well. The biggest risk is, you know, Bitco and the centralization. I would agree with that. I just want to say that while that makes sense, um, there's also a, a point which has been brought up a couple of times on this call to consider when you're using the price of an underlying asset as your source um, for an asset that is built on top of that underlying and, and whether there's any potential risks that you introduce there from having those be potentially disjoint. Uh, no, it's a great question, um, and I, I, in some sense, I think it's a governance question. So, governance, in some sense, needs to approve that risk, right? That, hey, this thing is a blend of the underlying asset and the asset itself, and like, what do we think is a fair value in terms of the oracle price? And I think it should be the underlying asset. And then, if something happens to the actual asset, you need to somehow in a governance way, I guess, act quickly to you know, stop trading in it or, or whatnot. So it's a good question. I don't necessarily know, know a good answer to that. I am going to jump into the sounds uh, and once again, try to take this opportunity to come out of the call with some action items that are a clear path ahead of us. Um, 22 minutes past the hour, so we're coming up on the end of the general Q&A uh, session of these calls. Um, Cyrus, can you do me a favor uh, and kind of put a bow on this thing so we know what's 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 coming for us in the next week or so? Right. Um, so based on the forum polls, my I, I'm interpreting this as we want to see governance polls for um, for a change in the USDC parameters, um, the addition of a an additional stablecoin such as Pax USD, and the addition of Link as a collateral type. So I, I think one way or another, those three should go out as I think ind independent governance polls to find out if maker community really wants them. Um, and then today in the forums, uh, I'll put up some threads where we can discuss uh, what potential risk parameters make sense and, um, and throw those as part of the governance poll. Uh, the, the caveat to all this being that even if the governance polls a yes, it, it, I don't think we can say at this time if it will be ready for this Friday's executive vote. Um, hopefully we can get some more discussion about that in the forums as well. Is that? Yeah, I think, I think that, that we're gonna... takes care of most of the action items, right? Yeah, um, so, does it make sense to start onboarding a gold oracle price at this stage? Well, that's part of the feasibility thing that I was talking about. So, um, well, I'll let Nick speak to that specifically. But 
we have smart contracts, we have oracles, like somebody needs to figure out how keepers are going to handle these new collateral types. There's, the, there's a lot of rabbit holes that need to be explored before we simply turn on a switch. So I think once these threads go up, once the polls go in, uh, it encourages the community to avoid uh, arbitrarily picking a deadline. So like, obviously let's move quickly, um, but uh, we need to do some exploration to figure out what's possible and what's not, um, how quickly we can do this stuff. Sorry, that was uh, my editorializing. Uh, Nick, did you want to speak to um, commodity pricing for gold? Um, sure. I mean, the, the I don't see the technical work being that much. I just only want to do it if you know this is something we're you're, you know seriously considering, right? So, um, if the community does some kind of signaling vote to say, you know, we want to. We're thinking of including some kind of gold-based token soon, so we want to create a gold oracle now. You know, it, you know, ahead of time, even though we're not going to use it for anything for a little while, then then sure, we we can do that. Um, it feels this is one of those things where uh, it came out of left field a bit, and so I'm concerned that maybe we haven't understood the implications completely of this thing. So maybe Lev and Greg and you and anybody else who's interested can get together and kind of think through what the implications are here because up until now our sources of truth have been uh, from DEXs on chain um, going outside of that ecosystem feels like a big step to me so maybe we should do some discovery here yeah I, I mean because it really correlates with the the liquidation mechanism right so the uh, that that's really what what you have to think about right um, and because the the liquidation mechanism right is the system purging itself in a form of kind of self-defense and if your reference price isn't correlated to the actual right uh, token liquidity I, I guess I would say right so Le Lev's argument earlier was that the the underlying right is gold um, so the, the price should always be relative to the actual price of gold right but in a uh, in a kind of auction environment right if uh, if um, I, I think a lot of the times you see some kind of churn, right? So you bid on a liquidation auction with some die, knowing that if you win, you can immediately like recycle it back. Um, and with 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 these kind of redeemable tokens, right? You you don't you can still do that arbitrage loop, but it's not really a a quick loop, right? It, there's there's a delay there, so there may be kind of limits to what the, the keepers are, are willing to, to what kind of capital they're willing to front, right? Because they're not gonna see quick turnaround time on that. Um, those are just all kind of things we have to consider. So when, so so yeah, that's more on the, the liquidation side of things, but the, the auction side of things is triggering those liquidations. Um, and so um, maybe you wanna liquidate something where the reference price says you shouldn't and, and vice versa, right? So those are all things that we kind of need to see how they, they interplay. Okay, so I'm going to summarize um, two minutes left. We have a whole pile of work to do, a lot of discussions to have, uh, signaling needs to be done, people need to interact with the forums, um, and we have an aggressive timeline ahead of us. Um, we, the first kick of this can uh, implies that there's um, intent in the community to make some uh, rapid changes to the protocol to uh, correct the peg. Uh, that's clear. The I'm checking my consensus meter. Consensus has not officially been reached because I say so. So let's get into the forums and let's have some chats. Let's figure out what next steps look like. Um, uh, work out some of these edge cases think about the things that I know that in my heart of hearts that nobody's considered yet that need to be considered and then come up with an implementation plan that makes sense with all the stakeholders and figure out what that looks like. Whether that translates into an executive this Friday or not, um, I don't think there's no guarantees at this point, but it's, it's an admirable goal and we'll take it from there. Does anybody have any strong opinions or concerns with that general vague plan of action? All right, cool, the window is now closed. Um, so let's assume that uh, we're gonna hash out the details in the forum. So please, uh, all the engaged stakeholders, everybody with skin in the game, please join us there and let's figure out the rest of the details. But 
All right, thanks everybody for coming to the midweek call. It's appreciated. Uh, videos will be posted soon to share with friends and family. Um, and uh, looking forward to seeing everybody on Friday or Thursday for the next call. All right, bye.